Methods are used to perform actions. A method is a block of code that accomplishes a task. The task can consist of multiple subtasks, but in general, a method performs one action, whether it's write some text, generate a new random number, save a customer, record an order. Typically, a method performs an action. Now, you can write as much code as you want in your methods, and you can even call additional methods from inside your methods if the task is broken up into subtasks. But in general, the method does one thing, and typically, you'll give it a name that describes the thing it does. Methods may or may not take parameters, so you may or may not pass additional information to it. The right line method in the console class is used to display text to the screen. If you call right line without passing any parameters, it writes a carriage return in a line feed, or a new line. If you want to display text, then you pass that text to the right line method, which in this case will display hi to the screen, and then write an additional line. And you may or may not want to return a value from your method. You might return a value to let the user know whether or not the method succeeded. So for example, console.writeline does not need to return a value. If you want to know if it succeeded, you go look in the screen. There's really no reason in your code to say, did WriteLine successfully write the line or the word hi to the screen? The usual typically look and see. On the other hand, the next method of the random class does need to return a value. You're calling next to generate the next random number in the series, and you presumably did that because you want to know what the random number is. So the next method will return a value, and that's the random number. There are two ways you can pass arguments to methods, by value and by reference. And the difference is that if you pass arguments by value, then any changes you make to that argument in the method is not visible to the calling code. So for example, you declare a variable and you set its value equal to 5 inside the method, that change is not visible to the calling code. On the other hand, if you pass an argument by reference, then any changes made in the method are visible to the calling code. So you have a variable, you set its value equal to 5, you pass it to the method, the method changes the value of that argument to 10. Back in your calling code, your variable is now equal to 10. By default, arguments are passed by value to methods. If you want to pass by reference, you have to ask for it. Let's go see how this works. I have the sample application running. Let's take a look at passing arguments by value and by reference. So I'll run the value and reference parameters example. And here we're going to create two variables. Amount is an integer, and that will be set to 25. Greeting is a string, and that will be set to hello. Then we'll display these on the screen, just to remember what they are. Next, we're going to call a method called modify params passed by value. And we'll pass to it amount, which is 25, and greeting, which is hello. Let's step into this and see that this method receives two parameters, both by value. Parm1 is 25, and Parm2 is the string that's equal to hello. Now inside the method, we'll change these. Parm1 will be incremented by 25. Parm2 will have the word world tacked on the end. So Parm1 came in as 25. It's now equal to 50. And the second parameter came in as hello. It's now equal to hello world. We'll display these, and then exit the method. And now back in the calling code, remember we passed amount in as 25, and it was changed in the method to 50. But because it was passed by value, those changes are not visible to the calling code. An amount retains its value of 25. Greeting retains its value of hello. So again, what happened is we created a variable called amount and a variable called greeting, changed those in the method, but back in the calling code, those changes are not visible to us. That's what happens when you pass parameters by value. Let's see what happens when you pass them by reference.
Again, amount is still 25. Greeting is hello. Let's pass those to the method modify params passed by ref or passed by reference. We'll step into that. And this method does the same thing the previous one did, only this time the parameters are passed by reference and that gets specified in the method. So parm1 comes in as 25, parm2 comes in as hello. We then change parm1 by adding 25 to it, change parm2 by adding the word world to it, parm1's 50, parm2 is hello world, and now when we come out of the method, back in the calling code, amount is now equal to 50, and greeting is now equal to hello world. So when you pass by value, changes made in the method to your variables are not visible to the calling code. When you pass by reference, changes made in the method are visible in the calling code. And again, and just remember that by default, parameters are passed by value. If you want to pass them by reference, you specify that in the signature of the method. Class constructors are code that's called when you create an instance of a class. And those are methods as well. Every class needs a constructor. The .NET runtime has to execute some code within the class to cause the object to be loaded into memory and make it available for use by the calling code. Now if you don't specify a constructor, then the compiler will automatically create one for you. And that'll be an empty constructor, empty meaning that it has no additional code in it. But you can create your own constructors, and if you want, pass arguments to them. And your classes can have multiple constructors. This is known as overloading. You could have an empty constructor, and then you could have one or more additional constructors that take any number of parameters. Let's go see a demo and see how and why you would have multiple constructors in your classes. I'm in the sample application, and I'm looking at the contents of the file customer.vb. And the code in here defines the customer class. The customer represents, obviously, a customer. The customer class has properties for customer ID, name, city, region, postal code, country, annual sales, location, how long the customer's been a customer, and a property for total sales. And there's also methods to retrieve customer information, save customer information, record sales, record orders, get the customer name if all you know is the customer ID, and then update and retrieve the location. We're going to look at these methods in this section. Let's run the application and see what happens when we create a new customer. So I'm going to run the add a customer example. And here in the calling code, we're going to create a new instance of the customer class. Let me step into that code and let's see what happens. Because the calling code said dim new customer as new customer, that calls the empty constructor. Remember that every class has to have a constructor. If you don't add this code yourself, the compiler will essentially write it for you. But here we've written it ourselves. The empty constructor is empty because there's no code in it. So the only purpose this code serves is to identify to the runtime what code to run so that the class can be created, stored in memory, and then used from the calling code. So we now have an instance of the customer, new customer, and it's empty. So we can then assign values to the various properties, identify the customer ID, the name, city, region, postal code, country, and we can display that information, and now we have a customer, Big Industries, in Redmond, Washington. And we've manually set the values of each of the properties. Well, this is totally valid, and we now have a customer with a name and a location. And you can sort of think of this as the following scenario. The sales rep goes to the sales manager and says, hey, we have a new customer. And the sales manager says, hey, that's great. Who is it? And the sales rep says, well, it's Big Industries from Redmond, Washington. That's valid. 
and this code handles that scenario. But there's another scenario, and that is that you don't create a customer with no name. There's no such thing as an empty customer or a placeholder customer. You can't sell to that customer. So if you're adding a customer, presumably this customer represents a real live person or company. And therefore, when we create the customer, we want to identify who it is. So in this scenario, the sales rep goes to the sales manager and says, hey, Big Industries is now a customer. So let's see how we can write code to make that happen. In the next line of code, we're going to create another new instance of the customer class, only this time we're going to pass as arguments to the class the information that describes the customer. And when we step into this, we see that we're now in an overloaded version of the new method, which is the constructor. An overloaded version of a method is the same method name with a different parameter list. So here, we're passing in the customer ID, customer name, city, region, postal code, and country. And all that information is passed to the constructor. The constructor then stores that information that we passed in to the private fields that are associated with each of those properties. So essentially what we're doing here is setting the properties inside the constructor same way as previously we set them in the calling code. So we now have a customer, the customer's properties are set, and finally we then want to save this information. We're going to call the save customer method which is a method in the customer class. And this method is going to save the customer information as XML. So we're going to use an instance of the XML writer class, which is in the system.xml namespace. And we're also going to use an instance of the XML writer settings class, also in the system.xml namespace. The purpose of XML writer settings is to give some instructions to the XML writer on how we want the XML written. So we'll create a new instance of XML writer settings, and that's stored to the variable settings. And then we'll set the indent to true, and we'll specify we want carriage return line feed when it's time to create a new line. Then we create a new instance of the XML writer by calling the create method and passing to it the name of the XML file we want to create. And this is going to be c colon backslash customer ID, which is big, dot XML. So this is the first parameter that gets passed into the create method, the name of the XML file. And the second parameter is the instance of the XML writer settings class. At this point, we're ready to start writing the XML file. Write start document with a parameter of true writes the XML declaration at the top of the file. Then we write a customer tag. Then we fill in the information. Write element string. We'll create a customer ID tag. Write the value of the customer ID to the XML file, and then close the customer ID tag. We do that for customer ID, name, city, region, postal code, country. Then write end element. We'll close off this customer tag. Write end document tells us we're done writing the XML file, and then we close the instance of the XML writer. Now we want to know if this was successful. We can use file.exists. File is a class in the system.io namespace, and the exists property takes as a parameter the name of a file. So if c colon backslash big.xml exists, then this method will return a 1 to indicate the customer information was saved. Otherwise, it would return a negative 1 to indicate that we couldn't save the information. And remember that all of that code was called from inside the class constructor. Now, we return to the calling code, and this customer has been created. The customer is Big Industries from Redmond, Washington. Notice that the properties are all filled out for us. And if we look on the hard drive, we see the file big.xml that we created.
Let's open that with Notepad. Here's the XML declaration, the customer tag, then individual tags for each of the properties and their values, and then the closing customer tag. And we can display that information here. Here's the customer we just created. Finally, let's create another customer, and we'll call this one duplicate customer. We're going to call the empty constructor. So now duplicate customer is an instance of the customer class with nothing in it except the default value for the country property, which is USA. And we're going to set this instance equal to the instance we just created for big industries. And when we do that, this duplicate customer is now an instance of the customer class representing the same customer as the one we just created. Let's display the information and review what we just did. In the first instance, we created an instance of the customer class and called the empty constructor. So we have basically an empty customer. Then we manually filled in the various properties for the customer and assigned it a name and a location. In the second instance, we passed all that information to the customer class constructor and inside the class filled out the properties and then saved that information to an XML file. In the third example, we created a new instance of the customer class using the empty constructor and then basically copied this customer into that class by just setting the two of them equal. So we now have three instances of the customer class all pointing to the same customer and all having the same values for the properties. So all three of these techniques are valid, whether you use an empty constructor and assign the property values yourself, or you pass that information into the constructor and assign those values when you create the instance of the customer class. Both of those are valid techniques. You can use whichever one makes sense, and you can also mix and match them as needed. Methods perform tasks, and often, the task will be to save or retrieve information. Now some classes may or may not be able to do this. There are classes in the .NET framework that can persist and retrieve information, and there are also classes that cannot. For example, the XML Writer class can write an XML file to disk, and the XML Reader class can read the file. So there's an example of a class that can persist information and a class that can retrieve information that's been saved. On the other hand, the string class does not have the ability to save a string to disk or to retrieve a string from disk. You can certainly write the contents of a string to disk, but you have to write that code yourself that's not provided by the string class. Well, the classes that you write yourself may or may not be able to save and retrieve information. But in the sample we're using in this section, the customer class, we do want the ability to store customer information on the disk and then go and retrieve it. Whether the information is stored in and retrieved from a database or written to a file on disk. So let's go into demo and look at the methods in the customer class that store and retrieve customer information. In the previous demo, you saw code in the constructor for the customer class that not only sets the properties of a new instance of the customer class, but also saved that customer information. So when we created a new customer, we passed in the values for the ID, name, and location, set the appropriate properties, and saved that information to disk as an XML file. That happened automatically. Now I'm going to comment out the save customer call in the constructor and we're going to manually save the customer information when we're ready. Now I'll run the application and I'll run the save a customer example. So now we're going to create a new customer, Big Industries in Redmond, and at this point the properties are set for new customer, but the information hasn't been saved.
So now let's call the SaveCustomer method on the new customer class. There are a couple of versions of this. Let's take a look at that. I type new customer dot save customer. Notice that there are two versions. One takes the customer information as parameters and returns an integer that tells you whether or not the customer information was saved. The second version takes no parameters. So let's look at these in turn. Let's run this version first and pass to save customer the customer information. So in this overloaded version of the save customer method, we're passing in customer ID, customer name, city, region, postal code, and country, and then writing that information to an XML file. The code to write the XML is the same code that we looked at in a previous example, so I'll just continue running through that code. I'll step out of this and return to the calling method. If the save customer method returns a positive number, then the customer information was saved. And again, that gets saved to the file big.xml, which looks like this. Let's look at another version of saving information. Let's create another customer. This customer is AppDev in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. And then let's think about this. We've created a customer. And this new customer variable has the property set. So if you think about it, in the previous example, why are we rereading these properties and passing them to the save customer method of the customer class when the customer class already has that information set. So we ask ourselves, why do we need to pass that information? Can't we just read that information? Doesn't the class know the values of the various properties that are set on itself? We shouldn't have to remind it. Let's look at the second version of the save customer method. And in this version of the method, we don't pass any parameters. Let's run this and see what happens. So here's the overloaded version of save customer, which takes no parameters. Again, we're going to write XML. But now, when it comes time to write to the XML file the values of the properties, because this method is inside the class, the class can basically say, what is the value of my customer ID, or my city, or my postal code. The me keyword references this class. So this instance of the customer class can read its own customer ID property by saying me.customerID, or me.customername, me.country. So now let's step out of this code and the customer information was saved to the file appdev.xml. Let's open that notepad. It's the same format. It just has the information for this customer. So again, two versions of the save customer method. One where we pass in the information. Sometimes that will be necessary. But in this example, in the customer class, it's not necessary to pass the information in because the save customer method can retrieve that information itself. And so we use the second example of save customer. Both write the customer information to an XML file. Well, now the information's been saved. The next thing we'll want to do often is retrieve it. The next thing we want to look at is how to retrieve that information. So let's run the retrieve a customer example. Let's create an instance of the customer class. And then let's retrieve information. What do we need to know to retrieve information? Well, we need to be able to specify the customer. Customers are uniquely identified by the ID, 
So we're going to call the getCustomerInfo method and pass to it a customer ID and then populate the values in this SumCustomer instance. Let's step into getCustomerInfo, which takes as a parameter a customer ID and then uses an instance of the XML reader class, which is in the system.xml namespace, to read an XML file. We need to pass to the create method of XML reader the XML file we're looking for, which is c colon backslash big.xml. We're then going to use the read to following method of the reader class to read through that XML. Read to following takes the name of an XML element and reads to the XML file until it finds the next instance of that element. So in this line of code, we're saying, read to the next instance of the customer element you find, and then keep doing that until you find no more instances of customer. Once you get to customer, then read to the first instance of customer XML, then, when you find customer, read to the next instance of the customer ID element, and then we're using the read inner XML method to read the contents of that, and that gets stored to the customer ID property of the class. Then, read to the customer name, store that to the customer name, big industries. Do the same thing for city, region, postal code, country, and we can read the city, the region, postal code and country. You can read that information out of the XML file. Then look for another instance of the customer tag. There shouldn't be one since we only wrote one. Well, this code inside the customer class is done is assigned values to the various properties of the customer class. And now, back in the calling code, some customer has its properties filled out for it. And we can then display that information and see that for the customer identified by the ID big, here's the information. So that's one way of retrieving customer information. We pass in the customer info, the customer ID, and go and read that XML file and take the contents of that and populate the properties of the sum customer instance. Let's take a look at another example of retrieving customer information. This time I'll run the retrieve customer information example, which is the letter I. And now in this code, we're going to create a new instance of the customer class some customer. We're going to create a customer name variable as a string and not assign it any value. And then create placeholders for the city, region, postal code, and country. These are all strings and they're empty strings. So we now have an empty instance of the customer class and empty variables to hold the information. Then we're going to call the getLocation method of the customer class and pass to it the customer ID and the empty strings for city, region, postal code, and country. And get location returns to us the customer name. So let's step into this. Get location takes customer ID as a string, which is big, and then by reference, empty strings for city, region, postal code, and country. So this code then creates a placeholder to store the company name, and then retrieves the XML file for this customer, big.xml, and then reads through it and stores in the string variables the company name, city, which again was passed by reference, and gets changed in the method. Same thing for region, postal code, and country. So these last four variables have been changed by reference and we'll be able to read those values back in the calling code. 
And then finally, we'll return the company name, which is Big Industries, back to the calling code. So now, customer name is returned by the method that's Big Industries. And because we passed this information by reference, we know the city, the region, the postal code, and the country. So we've done two things here. One is we've passed empty variables by reference to the method. The method code sets their values, and we can retrieve that information in the calling code. And secondly, what we've done is we've passed in a string, big, and we've returned essentially five values. Now, get location can only return one value, but by passing these other four variables in by reference, you can essentially think of get location as returning five pieces of information the name, and then the four pieces that make up the location. So we passed in big, and we got back all of the information we were looking for. So you've seen in this demo a couple examples of how you can write methods in your classes to both save information and retrieve information.